On April 21, 2021, the New Hampshire section of the IEEE produced an online forum to discuss extending broadband access to underserved locations, an important topic to many as the COVID-19 pandemic forced us to sequester at home. The goals of the Broadband Forum were to survey the demographic and economic issues that are hampering wide access to broadband, particularly in rural areas, discuss the technology options and trade-offs for providing broadband services, and highlight federal programs to extend broadband to unserved areas and describe one initiative in New Hampshire. Welcome uh, to tonight's Broadband Forum that's been organized by the New Hampshire section of the IEEE. I'm Gary LaRude, and I will be moderating tonight's forum. For those of you that may not be familiar with IEEE, it is the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. IEEE's origins are in electricity and electronics, and it has grown to almost 400,000 members in 160 countries. Access to high-speed internet, what has come to be called broadband, fits well within the mission, the expertise, and the interest of IEEE members. As you well know, access to broadband has become a national priority now, as the COVID-19 pandemic amplified the significant gaps in coverage and data rates in many areas, gaps which limit the ability to connect to work and school. And where coverage is available, the cost of service may preclude many from accessing it. Now, as unparalleled federal investments are being targeted in, uh, to close the uh, so-called digital divide, communities, their leaders, and each of us must determine which technologies and access models will best serve us. So let's uh, switch a slide. So this is a, a complex topic and our aim is not to give you the answer tonight. There is no single answer that fits all needs. So our goals tonight are more modest. We want to survey the demographic and economic issues that are hampering wide access to broadband, particularly in rural areas. We want to discuss the technology options and trade-offs for providing broadband services. And we want to highlight several federal programs aiming to extend broadband to unserved areas and describe a local initiative here in New Hampshire. We're privileged to have three knowledgeable speakers tonight who have volunteered their time to share their experience and perspectives and to answer questions. In alphabetical order, Eric Berger is a research professor of computer science at Georgetown University. He recently completed service as an assistant director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And before that was chief technical officer at the FCC. In both government roles, Eric focused on bringing broadband to underserved communities. Steve Camerino, is the President and Chief Executive Officer of New Hampshire Electric Cooperative, NHEC. NHEC was founded in 1939 to bring electricity to rural New Hampshire and has now extended its mission to expand high-speed internet service to underserved communities in New Hampshire. Larry Press is a Professor Emeritus of Information Systems at California State University, Dominguez Hills, he has followed internet via satellite projects since the first generation of low earth orbit constellations. And he has long studied the global diffusion of the internet with an emphasis on policy and technology in developing nations. And I'm Gary LaRue, an IEEE member and editor of Microwave Journal. The journal was first published in 1958 and covers the intersection of radio frequency technology and the markets that use it. Our agenda tonight is to hear from each of our speakers before opening the forum to your questions and discussing some of the issues which have surfaced during the presentations. Eric Berger will begin giving us a national perspective on the state of broadband, 
past initiatives to close the digital divide and the approach that's being proposed by the Biden administration to the extent the details are known. Larry Press will follow and provide a view of the low Earth orbit satellite systems that are being launched, with one already providing beta service to some 10,000 early adopters scattered across the northern latitudes. And Steve Camerino will speak to the broadband deployment underway by the New Hampshire Electric Cooperative. Then we will open the forum to questions from you and a spirited roundtable discussion. We are recording this event so it can be posted and viewed after we disconnect tonight. So if you find it informative and helpful, please share it with others so they can watch it after the fact. And now let's begin. I will uh, turn the screen over to Eric and let you get started with your presentation. Thank you, Gary. And let me just complete pulling it up here. Uh, and just confirming you're actually looking at my presentation, not, not me, correct? Correct. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so yes, uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, some of the federal programs uh, over the past few years and looking forward, but also talk a bit about the barriers. And as Gary just mentioned, a lot of these problems don't have easy solutions and for sure, they do not have one size fit all solutions. Uh, and then some considerations as we look at uh, some non-traditional ways of deploying broadband to unserved communities. I uh, believe it or not, there are 57 broadband access programs across 14 federal agencies in the US government. Uh, basically, there are so many that uh, NTIA, uh, which is the agency that advises the president on telecommunications, uh, has put together a searchable database. The link is there, and obviously we can uh, give that to you afterwards if you're interested in looking uh, for funding for uh, broadband. Uh, the big ones uh, that are pretty well known uh, from the Federal Communications Commission, there's the E-rate program, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, which you'll hear referred to as RDOF, uh, the 5G Fund, and uh, the Rural Healthcare Fund. Uh, the other uh, big agency, uh, or actually the agency doing a lot of funding, is the Department of Agriculture through the Rural Utilities Service. Uh, as we'll hear from Steve later, uh, this also uh, kind of grew out of the electrical uh, the electrification of the United States, uh, where today uh, there's a focus on broadband. Uh, their largest program is the Rural E-Connectivity Pilot Program, also known as ReConnect, but they have a number of community grant programs. As well, there are capacity building programs, educational programs, uh, you know, from like HUD and Department of Education, uh, Economic Development Authority, and in a regional federal uh, uh, agency is the Northern Border Regional Commission, where uh, again, they do some uh, matching grants to help uh, communities build out broadband. One thing you might have heard in the news is mapping. Uh, for most of the US population, there is a marketplace for broadband access. If you go two, three hours south, hit Boston, multiple providers, a lot of access, it's pretty much available, it's affordable, and you have choice. But in rural areas, the density may be so low that the return on capital will always be negative, uh, which means the market will fail to deliver. Uh, and so at that point, you need government intervention to deliver a good, in this case, broadband, that we as a society want everyone to have. Now, again, this is where we get into uh, uh, situations that are not yes or no. So, for example, if the government always intervened, for example, by competing with the private sector or imposing price controls, that kills private investment. And so then you don't have broadband access. Uh, likewise, if the government has paid someone to build in an unserved area, 
it would be a poor use of taxpayer funds to subsidize another supplier to that same area. That's the theory of why the FCC won't subsidize someone to go where there's already service. The problem is, how does the FCC know who is and who is not served? Now, it should be simple. Uh, you could do a dwelling by dwelling survey. The problem there is it's extremely expensive and it's also extremely intrusive. I don't think any of us want someone knocking on our doors asking whether or not we have broadband. Today, the states do some surveys and the FCC collects self-reported data from carriers. Uh, there is a challenge process uh, and some carriers have been caught lying. So it's not a free for all, but it's not perfect. Uh, it requires someone to look into care. The current rules are that if one dwelling has service in a census block, the presumption is the rest of the block is easily served. So if you see that uh, uh, figure on the left, that's downtown Concord. You can see the intersection of 393 and Route 3. And the census block in Concord is almost literally a block, a uh, city block. And so it makes sense that if one dwelling has service, it's likely that all the dwellings on that block could have service. On the right, there's a census block outside of Conway Town, that whole big section on the right there uh, with the river going through it. That, that's uh, one census block. So if someone lives here, which is in that big census block, kind of hard to see, there's a little splotch to the left of that uh, uh, cross there. That's another census block. That means there are probably a bunch of people who live there. Well, the person who lives in that house is at the end of the road there. They may well have internet service. The problem is somebody living up on the mountain there at the end of that road they're in the same census block, but it's not necessarily that they'll be easily able to get internet access. They're geographically far, it's across a river, there isn't a road connecting uh, the, the red and the blue crosses there. Uh, so while it makes sense to say if someone is served in a census block, pretty much anyone in that census block is served makes sense for cities. It's really hard uh, to say that uh, confidently in rural areas. Uh, this has been a problem that's been known for well over a decade. Uh, so Congress uh, in 2019 passed the Broadband Data Act, which the president signed last March, well, a year ago, March. Uh, and what it does is it requires carriers to inform the FCC where they actually deliver service. So they basically, for all intents and purposes, have to deliver route maps if they're wired providers or propagation models if they're wireless providers. And not just that an area, for example, get some radio waves from a tower, they actually have to be usable. Uh, so they also have to report on what the delivered quality is in that uh, region. Uh, the law also requires the carriers to deliver this information in a machine readable form. And the idea is that we could then create maps using common mapping programs to see where there is and is not service. And that map would show where the service is used, where it could be used, or is not available. And again, it has provisions for a challenge process. So even if we have these maps, a uh, question is, well, how do we get people actually connected? 10 years ago, pretty much all we were talking about was fiber to the home. We really have to have fiber to the home because we really have to have gigabit service. An interesting thing has happened in the past 10 years. We, we do have gigabit service available. Uh, some, uh, like for example, uh, in Chattanooga, the uh, rural or the electric cooperative there is offering 10 gigabit service. Uh, in southern New Hampshire, Comcast is offering two gigabit service. 
But the interesting thing is, even with that service available, most subscribers are choosing to take uh, on the order of two to 300 megabit service. Even in the pandemic, uh, where people decided to up their uh, bit rates, uh, we still see that the uptake uh, is, is relatively small for gigabit service. Now, FCC's broadband definition is what we call 25-3. Uh, that means 25 megabits downstream and three megabits upstream. And for the most part, pretty much everyone agrees that needs to be updated. 25.3 gives you a few high definition video streams down and maybe two streams up. That's okay if you're alone, but that's not great if you're a family of four doing Zoom for school, work, and then Netflix for play. Uh, in the RDOF uh, reverse auction, the absolute minimum is 25.3. However, if you read uh, the uh, order uh, putting together the uh, bids, the real minimum is 50 and five. Uh, the other thing that that auction does is it gives a preference, there are extra points, uh, if the uh, person who's bidding on providing the service can provide more than 100 down and 220 up, with a preference for gigabit down and half a gigabit up. And the ultimate offer, so it's not just that you're gonna offer this, but to the consumer, the price has to be comparable to what's paid in urban areas and the service has to be uh, pay, uh, comparable to urban areas. Uh, you'll notice I didn't say anything about fiber to the home. I didn't say anything about uh, 5G. I didn't say anything about satellite. RDOF is technology neutral. Along with RDOF is the 5G fund, uh, which is, as the name implies, focused on the fifth generation wireless uh, network technology. Here, the minimum speeds are 35 megabits down and three megabits up. Uh, this is actually rather reasonable. And in fact, that should be relatively easy to hit. Uh, low band 5G, that's below two gigahertz, uh, is getting 40 megabits per second. Mid band is getting 100 megabits and the high band 5G networks are uh, showing well over 500 megabits per second. So we have gotten to a point where, because it used to be 10 years ago, wired people got good 25 megabit service and wireless people got one megabit service. Here we're seeing that wireless is, is caught up with what people actually use. So let's look at who builds these networks. Uh, well, there are cable and phone providers like Altice and Comcast and Spectrum, RCN, AT&T and Verizon. Uh, they have the customer relationships already. They have billing systems already. Uh, importantly, they have trucks and technicians and franchise agreements with the towns and rights of way, uh, typically from the towns. Uh, they are selling a bundle for the most part of TV and phone although that is getting less important over time. And an indicator of that is some are bundling over the top video. So things like Netflix and Hulu, where it used to be they would be bundling uh, HBO and ESPN. It's a natural extension of their base businesses. Uh, for example, cable went to the internet protocol initially to support video on demand. And they found it was so efficient, they wanted to put all their services on IP or the internet protocol which made IP available for consumers kind of as a byproduct. Voice went to IP to support long distance calling. It's much more efficient than the old way of doing uh, telephone calls. Uh, and there were some regulatory advantages to bringing IP all the way to the home. Uh, the most common deployment today is to bring a wire or cable to the home and then bundle that service with a Wi-Fi router to uh, have uh, basically all the devices in the home connected. We see wireless providers like AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, Republic. Uh, there uh, you might see uh, per device. So if you have three devices in the home, you might get three subscriptions or uh, do MiFi, a mobile Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, it's not perfect. Those tend to come with limited data caps. And as we found in the pandemic, one of the first things to go was the carriers volunteered to eliminate the caps. Um, 
There's satellite providers like Q's, Viasat, and Dish. Uh, when I lived in New Hampshire, that was the highest bandwidth option, uh, which dates when I lived in New Hampshire because today, uh, comparatively not uh, high bandwidth. Uh, very high latency and extremely low data caps. Now it sounds like doom and gloom, but Larry will talk more about an exciting new technology called low earth orbit satellites, which address a lot of those issues. But fixed wireless can use licensed or unlicensed spectrum, basically to beam the connection from buildings or utility poles to multiple houses. Uh, U.S. Cellular, Mountaintop Telecom, Grasshopper Wireless in New Hampshire are examples of uh, fixed wireless providers. Because it's fixed wireless, uh, basically the physics allow us to have uh, either faster or more reliable service than with mobile wireless. And it also opens up the opportunity for unlicensed bands. Uh, electric co-ops I'll just touch upon because Steve's going to talk a lot more about them. But again, like phone and cable companies, they already have the customers, billing systems, trucks, technicians, and rights of way. Uh, there is a natural incentive, and this is for uh, electric in general. Obviously, a, a cooperative has an incentive. The members need broadband and they can give it. Uh, but uh, power companies also have an incentive, uh, mainly around remote meter reading which saves a ton of money by not having to send people out into the field on a monthly basis. And so if you're always ready putting a wire or cable or radio at the home, you might as well use it for other things like uh, delivering broadband. Uh, one thing I would note, uh, and this is true also for municipal networks, uh, co-ops don't need to charge consumers for profit. The part profit comes from the consumer's prop, uh, pockets. However, uh, providing broadband service does have a number of costs that dramatically go down with scale. And so even though you might have a nonprofit co-op or municipal network that's not taking profit, their costs can actually be so much greater than a commercial provider that the commercial provider can offer less expensive service. Uh, clearly, that's not always the case, and we'll have an existence proof uh, a little bit later uh, in today's webinar. Um, municipalities, I'll talk about municipalities in a moment. Uh, they are often uh, the best last resort. Uh, I'm sure there are other entities that build broadband networks, and I'm sure in the discussion part, if you're on the call, you'll, you'll uh, let me know about that. Uh, so apologies if I've missed you. So what gets in the way of broadband deployment? Around here, we have a thing called Shockey's Law, which is money's the answer, what's the question? So for wired networks, you know, kind of the question is how many subscribers can I connect to my fiber run? Uh, you know, I, I dig basically a trench that costs me a fixed amount of money. The more people I can amortize that cost with, the less expensive it is for me. Uh, likewise, uh, if I'm uh, in an urban area or suburban area, can I put a fiber through an existing conduit uh, or can I just uh, lash it to an existing utility pole or do I need to reinforce or even rebuild the utility poles or bore through granite to run a wire? Uh, clearly that gets very, very expensive. Likewise, if I'm a wireless provider, how reliable is the signal going to be from my tower to the user? Uh, and depending on the frequency, weather, like rain or snow, foliage, whether it's uh, winter and there's no leaves on the tree or summer, lots of leaves, and the terrain, is it very hilly or flat, uh, can really impact uh, how economical it is to deploy. And, uh, New Hampshire has all three. New Hampshire is like uh, pegged on weather and foliage and terrain. Uh, there are other factors. Um, one thing we found is that a not insignificant number of municipalities charge exorbitant pole connection fees. And this is a hard policy issue to balance. It's not really easy to say, well, just don't do that. 
uh, because you know municipalities have real costs for that infrastructure that you know they need to recover those costs uh, and municipalities need revenue uh, the balancing act there there's a number of municipalities priced the providers out of the market uh, which basically meant the municipality was hurting its own citizens uh, by making it not economical to have commercial service. Uh, the other thing is a consideration if a municipality is looking to build their own network, uh, especially if you currently have a video provider or a phone provider, those franchise fees that you're getting will probably go away. Um, and things to remember that I'm sure uh, Steve will be able to talk about, uh, building a network is a lot more than just buying and building it. It's more than buying routers and running fiber. Those are one times very expensive costs, but there are a lot of computers and amplifiers and power suppliers. And the service lives of those components are measured in single digit years. And so the question is who will drive the trucks to fix things that break? Who will pay for these continuous upgrades? And in fact, the University of Pennsylvania did a study in 2017 uh, looking at 88 municipal fiber projects. And of those 88 projects, all but nine of them were losing money. Uh, there were two that basically cleared the bar that they would be able to pay off their bonds. Uh, one was in Los Angeles, but it turned out that that was a community of literally 10 homes because it was really an industrial park. And so it was really a, a commercial deployment. And the other was in Bristol, Tennessee. Uh, the expectation is they'll pay off their loans in 34 years. Everyone likes to point to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, at the time that you did his study, it looked like it would take 412 years to pay off the loans which is two orders of magnitude longer than a lot of the equipment in the network. It's actually a lot better now. He was a bit too pessimistic, uh, but to give you an idea, they've already refinanced their debt a number of times. Uh, the thing to consider there is when a municipality defaults, when you've paid more for these networks than you'll ever make back, uh, either you default and your credit rating goes down, which means all of your other debt finance projects get more expensive, or you can increase the taxes to pay the bills, uh, which is not an unreasonable thing necessarily because uh, you might not actually need to raise the tax rate because with broadband, if you have more economic activity, you're getting more tax revenue. So you might be happy to tax yourself more because you're, you're having a better quality of life, better services, and in fact, more revenues. Uh, or you reduce the services to free tax revenue to pay the bills. There are new technologies uh, that uh, create new opportunities. Uh, so 5G low band, uh, if you have okay LTE service, the fourth generation, you can actually get pretty good 5G service uh, with, with that radio profile. Uh, in the mid-band, there's a new service uh, that uh, just uh, we completed the option and it's been live uh, starting uh, at the beginning of last year called CBRS, Citizen Broadband Radio Service. As the name implies, uh, there is a component of unlicensed operation, really good for rural areas where people are not really competing for that spectrum. Uh, and in fact, it can be a fiber replacement. Uh, you can use the 5G mid-band for um, a relatively long haul backhaul and then uh, 5G low band for local access. Uh, and then the high band, really the rural use case there is relatively short distance uh, backbone replacement, probably will not make much of an impact in rural New Hampshire. Uh, uh, Larry will talk about low earth orbit, uh, and uh, new technologies, they've been around, but getting more practical, a uh, thing called mesh networking, where basically a community basically all agrees to share uh, their, their uh, network. And so you just have a few carrier backbone connections. Uh, so uh, that's the uh, end of my presentation. I'm looking forward to hearing from Larry and Steve and uh, the questions from the audience.
Thank you, Eric. That's a really good overview, uh, just what I was hoping. And unfortunately, you've, you've uh, declared the problem being very sophisticated. So no easy answers as we were afraid. So Larry, um, let's see if you can connect to share your screen and we'll learn all about the low earth orbit satellite networks. Okay, with a little luck. Oops. We did it earlier, so hopefully yeah, we there can is. that. Just didn't look, I couldn't recognize the, uh, the ugly little screen. Okay, um, whoops, that's the wrong end. That's where we wanna be. And can you guys see it? Yes. Yeah, okay, can you see the cursor moving around? Okay, yes, we're in business. Yep. All right, exactly. thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk about, as uh, Eric's pointed out, uh, satellite broadband internet service. And just, um, let's get going. Oops. Why isn't this moving? That's weird. All right, um, be before I get into the presentation, let me just, um, talk about the characteristics of satellites at different orbit. Eric was talking about low Earth orbit. Uh, he also said that uh, earlier uh, that when he lived, uh, he, was, he was getting uh, uh, service from a geostationary satellite. And that's really still what's uh, commercially available today. Only SpaceX is, is doing beta tests of low Earth orbit. And you can see here the characteristics of uh, low, medium uh, Earth orbits and geostationary. Uh, and the big thing, the big differentiator is uh, the low Earth orbit, you see the latency there is much lower than it is with geostationary. That's why people don't like their uh, geostationary internet broadband service. Uh, the advantage to the uh, broadband, the geostationary, as you can also see, is that uh, the orbital, the time it takes the satellite to orbit is 24 hours. And so that means if it's orbiting at the equator, from a point on Earth, it appears to be fixed in space. So it's, uh, you can have simple cheap antennas. Um, anyhow, traditional broadband service uh, is still using geo constellations. So let me kind of give you one or two slides on that, and then I'll go on to talk about low Earth orbit. This thing doesn't want to advance. Okay, uh, clicking advances it, but not hitting the enter key. Um, this is the outline of the, of the whole talk. Like I say, I'll talk a little bit about geo. And then there are five fixed broadband Leo, Leo players right now. And I'll give you kind of a thumbnail sketch of each of them. And then I'll talk about mobile Leo broadband. And then talk again a little bit on this about the, the business, the revenue financing and capacity issues. Uh, and the challenges, there are some kind of easy technical challenges and some difficult, uh, not so easy challenges. All right, so let's start with geo, uh, geostationary. The figure on the right is, a, is a, a figure out of an article written by Arthur Clark, uh, Arthur C. Clark, right after World War II. He was a radio technician, I guess, in the army. And he, uh, this figure is showing that if a satellite is about 42,000 kilometers uh, up from the center of the earth, it'll take exactly 24 hours to make its orbit. So it'll remain um, in place. Uh, if you don't recognize the guy's name, he went on to write science fiction like 2001 A Space Odyssey and others. Um, the the geo satellites, they range in size from sort of school bus size to washing machine size. Uh, the washing machines, the micro geo, so to speak, are, are relatively new. Uh, their footprints, uh, the big ones cover maybe a, a continent or something, and, this, and the micro geos, uh, the size of a state, maybe Alaska, for example. Um, they don't give polar coverage. Just remember, the equal. They, they can't be uh, seen at the North Pole, for example. Uh, and as Eric said, they're used for video broadcast. Uh, and bad broadband. And the reason the broadband is bad, it's in, is the length is too high for satisfactory uh, applications. Anyhow, that's that. Uh, whoops. 
going to click. Uh, the situation is summed up in this one quote, I think, by Dan Goldberg, who's the president and CEO of uh, Telesat, which is uh, a 50-year-old geo company who's also decided to go into the Leo business. And he was asked by a journalist kind of why he did it. And the, journal, the article said there was a long pause. And um, then he said, what you can see there, I guess it's just something we had to do for us. Uh, you have no choice but to land at Leo. So that's uh, kind of an, an assessment of, a, of an established geo uh, guy. And um, as Eric said, uh, one company, SpaceX, is running beta tests. And if you look in the uh, Reddit Starlink discussion board, uh, they love uh, SpaceX's offering and they hate geo. So that's just confirmation for that. Anyhow, that's Barry Geo. And now talk to Leo. Uh, low Earth Orbit Satellite uh, started, the, the first attempt at it was in the 1990s, and it was a company called Teledesic, which was uh, headed by Bill Gates. And he also had uh, partners. One was a Saudi prince and another a guy who uh, sold a mobile company for a bunch of money. Um, and then it broke. They went bankrupt, and some people refer to that and, and say that's a bad omen, but I really disagree. The, the market uh, for internet service and technology is so different today than it was at that time um, that I think that's kind of irrelevant. Um, today, there are projects underway to launch tens of thousands of LEO satellites, uh, and they were to you know, do a fixed connectivity for consumers but also enterprises, governments, and cell tower backhaul, uh, that sort of customer. And also uh, mobile connectivity for planes, ships, trucks, and so forth. Um, and the final point there is, this is not intended to compete with fiber or 5G in densely populated areas. It's really for rural and unserved areas. So here are the, those five players that I mentioned. Um, I won't spend, I'll just quickly hit, go through each of them. Uh, like I say, SpaceX, SpaceX uh, they call their service Starlink, and they're way out in front of everybody else. Uh, they've got about 1,400 satellites up, uh, and they've got 12,000 satellites uh, offered, uh, authorized. Uh, they're offering beta tests. Uh, they say they've, a while ago, they said they had 10,000 users. I don't know if that was installations or, or households or what. Um, the, uh, their strategy is to, con is to go after consumers, direct to consumers uh, first, and then they will go after the other markets when the, when the uh, technology and the, you know, the, the constellation is, is ready. Um, they have a huge advantage in launch uh, in because SpaceX is a very successful uh, satellite launching company independent of Starlink. Uh, they do a lot of work for the government. Um, uh, you, you know, they, they, they just got a contract to, um, to land guys on the moon. Uh, they're vertically integrated. They, they, they're doing their marketing, design, manufacturing, all in-house. Uh, they only have, as far as I know, one significant partner, and that's Microsoft, which is going to offer a ground station service or has begun offering a ground station service and SpaceX will work with them. Um, <clears throat> the second company is their OneWeb is the only other one that has working satellites up. They have 648 uh, authorized and 147 are in orbit. They will begin service uh, in the, in the, uh, <clears throat> in the northern, um, in northern US, uh, Canada and North Europe uh, this year, and they hope to go global next year. Uh, they uh, were early on, but they went bankrupt and were bought out of bankruptcy by a consortium that was led by the UK government and Bharti, which is a, a, an Indian uh, telecom conglomerate that provides uh, internet service in India and parts of Asia and parts of Africa. Uh, so, and they, unlike SpaceX, are working with partners. All the um, satellites uh, uh, and whatnot are being farmed out. Uh, okay, Telesat is another one that's interesting. I, I just read you a quote by uh, Dan Goldman, their president and CEO, saying why he decided to go into the LEO business. 
Uh, they're a Canadian company. They've got 298 authorized satellite satellites. Uh, they're going to launch them in 200, uh, 2022 and 23. And one thing that's really interesting about them, uh, they are completely non-consumer by design. They, uh, Goldman says they, did, they studied the market and really decided that they didn't want to uh, design at all to, to serve uh, consumers. Uh, they've got 20 tests have been run with prospective customers. Uh, because they're not, uh, because of their sort of uh, non-consumer orientation, they uh, will, unlike SpaceX, will give a guaranteed service level agreement to a customer. And uh, they've got their design and manufacturing partners all selected. And they will, you know, they're maybe a couple of years behind SpaceX and, and OneWeb, but they say that, and it makes sense, that they, they will be able to deploy more advanced technology. And one of the sources of that is that they've been a, a contributor to the the um, uh, uh, Depart the uh, Department of Defense's uh, in the U.S. Uh, satellite constellation called Blackjack, um, which I'm not mentioning because it's not commercial. Project Kuiper is planning a little over 3,000 satellites, and this comes from uh, Jeff Bezos of, of uh, Amazon fame. So one thing we can be sure of, though uh, a lot of details are known, it will have one advantage of integrating well with Amazon's uh, web and ground station services. Uh, the other thing that's nice is Bezos is rich uh, and he owns a launch company and he's interested in space. So, uh, and he's stepping down as the CEO of Amazon. So I think he'll have a lot of time to uh, to pursue this, I think it's a, it's an important thing. He he, he evidently was a, a space nut since he's been in high school. And the last one that I show there is uh, Guo Wang, and you can tell it's a, a, a Spanish a Chinese company. Uh, they're planning to uh, put up uh, almost thirteen thousand satellites. Notice that's more than SpaceX has uh, permission to do. It's a Chinese state-owned company, which should take care of. Uh, of uh, financial worries, plus it'll give them uh, good access to the Chinese, um, you know, space ecosystem, if you will. Uh, they'll probably market through the three big Chinese telephone companies domestically. Uh, but the more interesting thing is globally, uh, China has this uh, uh, global infrastructure project called the Belt and Road in Initiative. And they've got 40, they're doing work in, or work and have or have MOUs with 40 different nations. So uh, I think that Guoang will be a, a, a international threat. And that's the Leo players. Uh, just to mention these real quickly, because they're not quite real yet. Uh, the EU is working on a proposal for a Leo constellation. And one of the EU participants is SES, a Luxembourg company, and they already have very significant profitable uh, Mio and Geo constellations. And um, it's a cool company. And they, they say they envision an integrated software divine, defined multi-orbit constellation with all three layers in the long run. Uh, that's kind of where their vision, where they're headed. Uh, yesterday, I saw a vaguely worded announcement that hinted that Guo Wang may not be China's only Leo broadband ISP, but I just stay tuned on that. There may be another. Uh, Russia is said to be working on a 600 satellite constellation, but with only $130 million budget alloc allocation uh, through 2022, uh, it must be just in the design stage. I don't know anything about it. And last but Last and least, uh, Viasat, another geo company, uh, has now applied for a Leo, um, uh, Leo satellites. But as far as I know, they haven't yet received permission. Okay. Uh, yeah, this, the fact that SpaceX is so far ahead uh, reminded me of IBM. I, used, I worked there a long time ago. And we used to call the computer industry um, it was comprised of IBM and the seven dwarfs. And you can see the, the names of the dwarfs over here. Those were IBM's competitors at the time. And they are no longer in the computer industry, in the computer business. Um, 
uh, SpaceX dominates today, and I know at least one guy thinks they're gonna, they're just unstoppable. Um, but I disagree that the market and applications are very, very diverse. Technology is changing fast and politics are a huge factor. So I wouldn't be surprised to see all five of the companies that I just highlighted uh, uh, prevail, continue to exist. Uh, I said, I'd say a little about mobile background, uh, mobile broadband. <clears throat> uh, all the, I think all those five Leo vendors will eventually pursue uh, mobility on air, land, and sea. Uh, and like, like before, SpaceX, though, is a little bit out in front. Uh, they have got an application with the FCC to connect trucks, ships, and planes uh, in the US, but not yet autos. They've announced that they'll support uh, mobile mobility in the US this year once they've uh, update software and they have coverage with um, satellites. Um, and just the, the final thing, the little picture there is a data sitting out in the desert. Uh, remember I said they're partnering with uh, Microsoft uh, ground station services. So the, uh, one thing they could do, it, you can imagine mobile data centers like the, the one in the picture. Um, I don't know if you guys remember or even knew, but uh, Sun Microsystems used to have a uh, little portable data center, not little, portable data center in containers. Um, anyhow, and last and kind of least, uh, there are several companies talking about orbiting cell towers, basically being able to, to you know, if you can't get a, a um, connection to a terrestrial cell tower, that'll fail over and connect you to uh, a satellite. Uh, I don't know anything about the technology they're proposing, and it sounds really hard. I'll, I'll say seeing is believing, and maybe what they're uh, talking about is voice and text only. I'm I'm really not sure. One thing I know that makes me kind of I don't know, skeptical. Uh, one of the companies, AST Space Mobile, they brag that they've got over a thousand patents behind this. And I checked, and and uh, SpaceX only has seventy nine. So it, again, it kind of feels like hype, but I don't really know. Oops, I can't, you have to click. Um, the final mobile thing that I want to talk about, and this is for real, is, is G-Space. Um, and G-Space is part of the, uh, uh, actually it's G-Space, I, I found out. G-Space is included in the uh, Geely Holding Company, which is a really big company in China. They manufacture eight auto brands. Uh, they're the largest Daimler uh, shareholder and more. And they envision um, what's kind of shown here in the in the uh, in this picture, uh, kind of a, a really air, land, and sea smart logistics uh, capability from uh, low Earth orbit satellites. And again, this will have nothing to do with uh, internet broadband, but it's a special, uh, a specially focused, uh, special purpose. Uh, uh, view, vision they have, and they have a, a lot of funding, and they, they've done a lot of real things. I got uh, just take this much of aggression. This is you know Elon Musk, and this is uh, Li Shufu, the Geely, uh, who's the founder of um, of, um, of the entire uh, holding group, uh, and they have a lot in common. I won't say anything more, but like one example, like. Uh, Shufu has published an open source architecture for sustainable uh, electric vehicles, which he's going to do with uh, all of his uh, auto companies. And that sounds like the kind of thing Elon Musk would do. Plus, they're both self-made billionaires. Uh, anyhow, let's go to the uh, business stuff a little bit, and then I'll wrap it up. Uh, SpaceX right now is the only uh, company that's charging anybody anything. They uh, have their beta users pay $500 for the terminal and then $99 a month for uh, non 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 uh, uh, tiered service. And this is in right now just in affluent nations, uh, uh, northern US, Canada, Germany, uh, UK. Um, and so then you say, what about developing nations like O3B? Uh, O3B. <laughs> OneWeb was really founded with the purpose of serving developing nations. Um, and I think a couple observations. For one thing, I believe that, that the develop in, in 
pr consumer prices will be lower. They'll be affordable in developing nations. It, it makes no sense to uh, charge more than uh, the, the thing that's rational is to use all your available capacity. So I think that uh, that five hundred dollars and ninety nine a month is is not going to be in a in a poor country. Um, also, um, the kind of thing Eric said, there are going to be subsidies from NGOs, foundations, local and national governments. Um, SpaceX is an applicant for those R R RDOC funds for uh, rural, rural broadband in the U.S. And then there will be also revenue from the non-consumers, governments, enterprises, mobile phone companies, airlines, shipping companies, and so forth. Uh, they will be much less price sensitive than, than uh, consumers. Uh, things like uh, service level agreements will be important to them. So that's the revenue side. I keep remember, I have to click. Um, finance, how's that coming? Uh, bottom line, I won't uh, make you listen to me read all of these things out. Uh, I think the bottom line is that uh, all of them seem to have the first constellation covered. Uh, SpaceX has is very uh, able to raise private capital. Uh, Telesat has their income from their um, uh, from their geo uh, business. They uh, they have uh, uh, done work for the U.S. Space Force. They've got the kind of subsidy that Eric was talking about from the Quebec government. Uh, and they're planning to make up the, the difference uh, with uh, debt and, a, and an IPO. Uh, same thing, OneWeb, um, they got a nice uh, deal when they came out of bankruptcy for a billion dollars, they got $3.3 billion in assets. And uh, they say they need a billion to finish the first constellation and they seem confident to get it. Um, Kuiper, uh, Jeff Bezos has made a personal commitment of $10 billion, that should be enough. And Guo Wang is a Chinese state-owned enterprise, so it will be financed. Uh, capacity. Um, uh, yeah, Gary asked me to talk about capacity, and I'm going to have to hedge it a little bit. Uh, I, I don't. I can't. I can't do it. Let me give you an example why. Um, here's two SpaceX uh, capacity projections for 2026. Uh, Cowan Financial Services looked into it and they said that SpaceX will have capacity for 100, 485,000 simultaneous users. And then Gwen, uh, Gwen Shotwell, who's the president and CEO of, of SpaceX, uh, says that th by that time they'll be able to serve all 20 million U.S. households. Um, and, you know, they're all over the place. I, I tend to believe that Gwen Chatwell has thought more about it than Cowan, and, Cowan Financial, but I don't know. And the, the reason it's difficult is each company is different. There's, their, um, their technology is different. Their, uh, their orbit, con their uh, satellite configurations of their satellites are different. Um, and the technology and applications will have changed like crazy during the next five years. And I could start to, I just started to do examples, but I quit, but like uh, within five years, they will all have um, inter-satellite laser links connecting the satellites that are in orbit. Uh, processor speeds will have uh, improved. On the other hand, people are gonna wanna watch 4K video. So it's, it's uh, I'm gonna have to pass on capacity. Um, I, the, I'll finish up with the challenges. Here are three um, short-term technical challenges. I'm confident that they're going to—they're all going to be met. Uh, SpaceX says they're they're cost paying fifteen thousand today for each terminal. They say it'll be a, a few hundred in two years. Uh, mobile terminals right now are they're they're priced for uh, commercial applications. You know, they're on army tanks and stuff like that. They're expensive, and my guess is uh, within five years. There'll be an option on both Tesla and uh, Geely automobiles. Um, internet, uh, internet, inter-satellite laser links, ISLLs. Um, I think that all the constellations that survive will have them, but it's a tough thing. SpaceX initially planned to have five on each satellite, but the cost was too high. So their version one satellites, the ones that are up there now, uh, had none. And they just deployed 10 
polar orbit satellites with four ISLLs, and they've requested permission for, for more. Um, Telesat, like it says at the bottom, is going to have them from the start. And I think all of these guys will uh, have ISLLs uh, because they let them cut down on latency. They cut down on their grant, ground segment uh, investment costs, and they enable gold coverage. I, they're just, they're going to all be there. Uh, last but and not least for sure, uh, difficult problems requiring global standards, cooperation, and regulation. The map on the right shows that uh, 17 nations own or, and, or operate satellites uh, and they're critical infrastructure for the globe. Not, it's, it's, not a, it's not just uh, internet connectivity. Um, so I listed four, um, four difficult problems. Uh, one is uh, reflected light uh, off the satellites, especially when they're uh, um, relatively low. Um, and that interferes with astronomers. And I think astronomers and, and um, they will find ways to mitigate and or live with it. Uh, people are working on that. Spectrum sharing, again, there are gonna be a lot of satellites up there at a lot of different altitudes and they will have to do spectrum sharing. Uh, that's the kind of thing you IEEE guys uh, will figure out the technology and, and the regulation for. Uh, a bigger one, I think, than that, or a tougher one, is collision avoidance. Um, it will require, when we get so many satellites up, especially in low Earth orbit, that uh, data sharing and forcible standards and, and practices and collaboration are going to be necessary to avoid collisions. And that's going to be difficult when you think that some of those satellites are military satellites. I, that is a problem. And the, the final one I list there, um, antisocial applications. We all know about all the, we, when the internet started, we thought it was going to be all good. And we certainly, uh, we understand that people do some bad things with the internet now. Um, and they, one example that comes to mind is that fa Facebook, uh, me, when they went, uh, Facebook was used against the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar a year after internet privatization. And before that, Myanmar had 1% uh, internet uh, penetration. So uh, anyway, I didn't want to depress you, but that's, that's it. I guess we, we have worked out ways to cooperate in international law and whatnot and regulation on the high seas. And hopefully we'll be able to do that for uh, space as well. And that's all I have. Thank you, Larry. If you would um, unshare your screen. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, now we are going to uh, switch to Steve. And I need to share the screen here. So we've... Um, talked about, um, Eric gave us a, a good overview of the, uh, the US situation and uh, Larry has given us a global view, uh, certainly with application to US, but obviously satellites cover the, uh, the entire planet. So now we are going to do more of a local dive into uh, New Hampshire. And uh, Steve is gonna talk about the, uh, what the New Hampshire Electric Co-op is doing. So Steve, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, Gary. And I uh, just wanna make sure to do a sound check. You can hear me okay? Yes, yeah. you sound good. Great. Um, so uh, we did a little practice run before we brought everyone else on and my screen sharing wasn't working great. So I've asked Gary if he would do this for me. So uh, when Gary asked uh, me to speak, he asked me to send him a bio and I realized I can now update my bio and add a sentence that says, Mr. Camerino has over nine months of experience in the broadband industry. Um, and so my, what I'm going to share is a little bit of what I'll call tales from the broadband trenches, uh, which is kind of the co-ops experience and uh, why we're undertaking this, this endeavor. So uh, you can go ahead to the first full slide, Gary. So a little bit first about who we are. Um, the Electric Co-op uh, was established in 1939 
And like other co-ops in the country, we essentially were formed to provide electric uh, utility service to areas that the investor owned utilities didn't feel were sufficiently prof profitable to serve. And to a large extent, that's why we have this um, crazy quilt uh, service territory. We're the green. Um, and you can see that we serve all the way down in Southeast New Hampshire, down to Raymond and Derry, Chester. We even have a few members over in the Durham, uh, Lee and Madbury area. And then over in Southwestern New Hampshire, where our first poll was, uh, we served all the way down to Lemster. Uh, extensively in the Lakes region and Southern White Mountains and Mount Washington Valley. And then that thing way up north is our Colebrook district, which includes portions of uh, Stewartstown and Clarksville. Um, so we're very spread out, um, but we serve around 85,000 members, which um, remarkably makes us the second largest electric utility in the state, just for reference, uh, Eversource is over 700,000. So they're almost 10 times larger than us. Um, and we touch, 118 different communities. And some of them we serve the entire community and others we may only serve 10, 12, 150, 250 uh, homes. So we're, we're very spread out. Um, we are not for profit. And as a cooperative, we are owned and governed by our members. So we're um, legally, we're just like your food co-op in town. Uh, the thing that's very different is you don't choose to join uh, NHEC. You become a member because you move into our service territory. And like other uh, utilities, we have a monopoly on the distribution of electric service. That is a very important uh, difference from the broadband industry. And uh, it's a significant consideration as the co-op uh, looks to expand into broadband. So next slide, please, Gary. So this is the same uh, picture of of where we serve in New Hampshire, but I want to describe a little bit about how it looks when you're considering getting into the broadband business. Of those 85,000 uh, accounts that we have, um, there are effectively about 77,000 plus total service points for broadband purposes. So then uh, we try to assess, well, what's the need out there? And on what the FCC calls an unserved basis, which means less than 25 down and, and three megs up, we're told that it's about 4,200 of our members who are unserved, who don't even have that level of service. Um, I'm gonna come back to that number in a minute. You see there's a couple of question marks there. When we look at what we call underserved, which is everybody um, with less than 100 megs um, of uh, internet access, that number um, we, uh, is officially around 25,000. And those, that includes all the people who are told that they have 25.3 DSL service. And again, I'll explain what I mean by told that. Um, but um, our understanding from uh, talking to um, people who know our territory well, they say that number may be as large as 50,000. That um, if you did actual speed tests, at our uh, members' homes, you would find that 50,000 of those 77,000 had less than 100 um, megs of internet speed. Um, and what you would also find is that many of those people who nominally, according to the FCC, have 25.3, have um, 10, 3, 2. Uh, one of our board members uh, said today he's been to a couple of people's homes where they have one megabyte of service, even they're told they have 25.3. So um, you can see the challenge of getting good data and actually knowing who served and how they're served is um, significant. And if you're trying to assess what's the need of an area, this is a real problem. And if you're trying to assess what are the potential take rates of your service and how viable is your business model, uh, it's an even bigger problem. Um, and that second number, most of you know this, but um, I think pre-COVID people never paid any attention to that second number, the three and the 25-3. But you can't be on a call like this unless you have good upload speeds. And especially if you have a spouse who's doing the same thing from their computer and two kids who are doing the same thing. And uh, that is a, a, a challenge that I don't think 
people were overly worried about, not, not consumers anyway, pre-COVID, and now um, we pay a lot more attention to. And so one of the things the co-op is very focused on is providing not just high-speed service, but high-speed symmetrical service, both up and down. So uh, next slide, Gary, please. So why are people looking to the co-op uh, as a possible answer uh, to uh, filling the void for unserved and underserved areas of the state and, and frankly, across the country? And we're not the only co-op people are talking about. There are many co-ops that are looking at the same opportunity. The, the first, as uh, was referred to earlier, is the success historically of the electric co-op model. Electric co-ops were formed to fill exactly this kind of void with regard to electric service. And large portions of rural and agricultural um, America were um, severely, severely economically challenged uh, through the 1930s because urban and more developed areas had electric service and farm America and rural America did not. And that um, created deep poverty and held those areas back from economic development. Um, the second is that uh, our form of governance is we're nonprofit and we are member focused and we take that mission very seriously. And so our sole reason for getting into this business, it's not the profit, it's the service. It's making sure that our members have this service. And then the third thing that we bring that can be a difference maker is we have low cost capital. Our borrowing rates are extremely low and the returns and payback periods that we require are far lower than for private investors. So just to give you a sense, our cost of money is roughly in the three to 4% range um, and um, can be a little lower at times, can be a little higher, but it's, it's down in that range. And private capital uh, may be looking for as much as 20 or 25% return. And so we can, invest in providing service in areas that private capital would, would never go. But, and I wanna stress this, there are limits. It, it still has to operate in the back, black. It has to pay back in a reasonable period of time. And some of these areas are um, lack density so much that even that's a challenge. Um, next slide, please, Gary. So um, what has been the history of NHEC's approach to broadband and, and what has changed. Um, so the first and most important thing from our standpoint is um, we've had and continue to have a deep and abiding concern about financial risk to our electric balance sheet. We take extremely seriously our obligation to our members to provide electric service. That's what we were formed to do. Um, and we do it with our members' money, not with investor money. And we don't want to do anything that puts that mission at risk or that could cause our electric costs to go up. And obviously, if, if a broadband venture were not to operate in the black, there's only one place where the money can come from, and that's from the electric side. Uh, and those of you who know, uh, I tell folks the co-op's kind of a depression era child, and it isn't just because we were actually born in the depression. It's also because um, in 1991, we had a bankruptcy because of the Seabrook nuclear power plant investment, a mere 2.7% ownership interest, and we never, ever want to go there again. And today we're financially strong. We're proud of that, um, and we want to maintain that. So that, that is something we keep our eye on throughout this process. And so that concern, uh, we had a lot of people knocking on our door for a long time saying, we need broadband and you should do this. Um, you can do the same thing you did for the electric side. And we kept saying, we agree you need broadband, but we aren't sure that we should be the ones to provide it um, because of our concerns about risk. And so we took a stance of what we called facilitate and support. We wanted to do everything we could to help others bring broadband to our service territory. And almost without exception, there are a couple of very small exceptions in very limited um, geographic areas, we found that had no, um, that didn't advance the cause at all. There was no change in the landscape and our willingness to try to find ways to um, help others get there um, just wasn't making progress. So that, that was out there. Um, 
when uh, a couple of things happened essentially simultaneously. One is the pressure from our members um, to bring broadband to them really increased significantly, both in the form of a member petition to change our bylaws, as well as um, representation on the board of directors. But the, uh, the, the critical part, which I think changed our perspective, was COVID-19. Um, not only did it become apparent to everyone that the need was immediate, not over time, but immediate, but more important, our perspective changed that it was actually the lack of internet service in, our, in all of our service territory was going to, in the long run, challenge the viability of the communities that we served. Would people buy homes in those towns? Would they start businesses? And if the communities weren't healthy, would the co-op itself as an electric provider be healthy in the long run? Um, and so that perspective that the lack of internet wasn't just something that um, was good um, to have, but that it actually could, um, could challenge the long-term health of the co-op really changed our perspective. Next slide, Gary. So we formed a subsidiary, uh, New Hampshire Broadband LLC, to focus on the development of broadband. And I won't read the whole mission statement to you. The, the essence of this is that our mission is to ensure that all of our members have access to affordable, reliable, high-speed internet service. The, the key words here are have access. So we were not going into this to have a business, to make a profit. We wanted to make sure that our members were served. And if that was done by somebody else, that was just fine with us. The problem was that wasn't happening and we felt we needed to step in. Next slide. So what have we done to date? Uh, the first thing we did was we applied for um, grants through the state of New Hampshire, the Office of Strategic Initiatives for the Connecting New Hampshire Emergency Broadband Program, which we call, we call these the CARES projects. And we submitted for two projects, one up in the Colebrook area uh, and the other down in Lemster, and you can see them on the map there, um, to serve a uh, little under a thousand properties. Um, and that was a breakneck process. We um, submitted the grant in July. We actually signed contracts with the state in the middle of August. And the way the program worked, it had to be capable of providing service to all of the submitted homes by December 15th. We made it by about 36 hours. Um, I do not recommend that to anyone. <laughs> Uh, we made it because of the companies that you see listed there. We went to Mission Broadband, some of you know, uh, and asked them if they would take the lead and make sure that happened. Uh, Tilson, we contracted with to actually build the network. Uh, First Light provided the internet service. Granite State Communications provided uh, a lot of the um, customer subscriber related services and Eustace Cable um, put the cable up uh, in portions of the territory doing the, the service drops, et cetera. Uh, and so as uh, overnight, this team was pulled together and put this project up. Um, and that was a crazy grant program that had a uh, crazy deadline uh, and uh, we got there. So that, that was kind of the pilot, if you will. And uh, that's been going quite well. Uh, you wouldn't do these on a standalone basis. We obviously were planning to make this part of something larger. Um, and so that's the next slide. So the next thing we did is we applied to, you've heard this already, the RDOF, R Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. And they have a reverse auction, which means the prices go down um, as there's more and more, as there's interest in serving different areas until people drop out and whatever the price is dropped to, that's what the remaining bidder um, is awarded. We were awarded six and a half million dollars for 70 census blocks, uh, block groups actually, I, I believe it is. And uh, we um, really had hoped to get a fair amount more. Uh, I won't think this is probably more detail than people wanna hear for tonight, but that auction did not run, I think the way the FCC wanted it to. Um, but we were committed 
we won these blocks because we knew we were going to build in these areas. And so we were committed at whatever level of support we could get. And so in some of these areas, we got a fair amount of support and in others less. The six and a half million dollars isn't a capital payment all up front. We get it over 10 years. So it's sort of an adder to our revenues. So this is kind of the big first big step forward in the build out of, of um, the plans for build out of the system beyond those first two projects. Next slide. So what challenges do we face on an ongoing basis? Um, the, the first is um, timing. Uh, there are all sorts of, of things that really force our hand to move a lot faster, I think, than an organization that hasn't done broadband before really would normally like to do. Um, there, the grants are available now. We need to put you know, have a, a proposal that is capable of getting grants uh, and then move forward with them. And that's, CARES is a very good example of that, of, you know, you, you have this time pressure that's created because the money is there now. Um, we have members who want the service now. And typically for a territory like ours, a, a build out process um, in the past for many co-ops might've been four to six years. If we go to the communities we provide electric service to and say, we're doing this and we're going to be there in six years, you might as well say we're never coming. And so there is a tremendous amount of pressure. We literally, when we were doing the CARES project, so remember that was um, the late summer, fall of last year, we had a member come to one of our board meetings, which are open to the public, and tell us how they needed to have broadband by Christmas. Um, so I think um, consumer expectations and needs are um, just uh, really off the charts um, because that's how they really feel about it. The, the next thing is um, competition and technological obsolescence. So remember that we are a monopoly business. And uh, so that's about the best form of uh, risk mitigation you can have. Um, and now we're entering a competitive market where there's a lot of money available even to the core profit providers to extend their systems. Uh, you add to that, um, we're used to dealing with assets that have useful lives of 30 years, 50 years. We depreciate them over that time period and that's how they're reflected in our rates. And suddenly we're investing in technology. Uh, you heard Larry's presentation that who knows what the useful life is. It could be surpassed not, not because the equipment is broken down, but by better technologies, faster technologies in a short period of time. So the kind of um, payback periods that we're used to, um, while we have very patient capital, we have to worry about whether that undermines the viability of the investment. And so then that gets us to the financial risk concerns. Um, we're playing with member money and uh, Larry, uh, I think it was mentioned a couple of bankruptcies in his presentation. We talk about bankruptcies in tech in the tech world all the time as if it's nothing because there'll be somebody else there to provide the service. We don't talk about bankruptcies in the utility industry. That's just not an acceptable response. And so we need to find ways to, to mitigate the risk that we face. And so that's something we really are focused on. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then the last thing, which um, we're actively working on is there are um, so many efforts by so many parties to solve this problem, even just in the state of New Hampshire. Almost every community has its own broadband committee and the counties have broadband groups. And they're all talking to different providers and putting out RFPs and trying to solve this problem themselves. And you have this patchwork quilt in a way that's both a challenge and an opportunity for us. The challenge is that we're, we're trying to create a viable business model. And then you have these individual towns that get, could, could get picked off one at a time and kind of cut away the core of what you're trying to create. On the other hand, we believe we can be the difference maker as a nonprofit entity that cares about the service we're providing to our members. Um, we think we could be the unifying factor uh, rather than a for-profit venture that um, is really um, not as uh, not as service focused, they're really profit focused. So we think there's an opportunity there, but it doesn't come without its challenges. So next slide, Gary. 
So next step, so where are we? Um, really the two guiding principles for us at this point are, we wanna make sure that we are providing world-class service to our members. We think we do that well already um, with our electric members. Um, um, and we wanna make sure that our um, broadband customers don't just have good customer service, they also have world-class broadband service, meaning you know, at least a gig up and a gig down, you know, if not better over time. So something that's gonna be future-proof. And to protect our electric members, we wanna make sure we're mitigating risks. So we're, we are looking at a business model that doesn't have us um, just making an investment and waiting, you know, 10 or 15 years to hopefully get our, our money back, but find a way to partner um, and bring to the table what we do well and the benefits we can bring, but do it with somebody who um, maybe knows the industry a little better than us and can um, mitigate some of the risks that we see out there. So that, that's uh, what I've got. And I'll turn it back to you, uh, Gary. Unmute myself. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Excellent uh, presentation. Uh, it's kind of hard to know where to begin here, but we want to give our audience, our viewers, a chance to engage. So if you have a question, uh, I think you'll see a Q&A box or a panel that you can click on and enter your question. Uh, we're also getting some uh, chats that are coming in through the chat. So I'll try to keep up with everything and uh, we'll get through as many of these as we can. While I uh, get myself organized and look at those, let me ask Eric a question. Um, we've referred to the RDOF several times. My reading of the FCC, at least the phase one auction results is there were four recipients who got awards in New Hampshire, uh, three others in addition to the uh, electric cooperative. One was the Starlink system. And then I think Consolidated Communications and Charter Communications also got pieces of the pie. Um, and I know there's a lot, it appears to be there's a food fight taking place at the FCC with different uh, people claiming that some of the winners can't do what they said they were gonna do or the technology that they claimed has been hyped that they can't get those data rates. Eric, can you give us just a, an overview of where is the FCC in this process and how long is this sort of more detailed review of these proposals going to take? Yeah, I uh, hate to sound cynical about my former agency, but <laughs> I, you've got, in a sense, some, some uh, very powerful interests. You've got, uh, you know, almost literally an individual, as Larry was talking about uh, with, with Kuiper, you also have a, a very rich individual with, with Starlink. And, uh, you know, they're really insisting that their service will meet the RDOF minimums. And you have others uh, like Steve who can deliver stuff today. And, and he can demonstrate what he can deliver. And so, you know, do you wait and see if the other stuff really does work? Or do you go with a burden hand? But you know, if the stuff does work, it'll be a lot better and a lot less expensive. And now we're talking about the nation's taxpayers. Uh, in a sense, I'm glad I'm, I'm, I'm not in the building anymore. So um, back to you, Steve, a question. Um, you talked about being a monopoly and certainly your electric service is well-defined. How, how is broadband defined? Can you declare that you can deliver broadband where you provide electric service? Or uh, what, what is the process to define where you will serve with broadband, assuming all the other issues fell into place? So our, our focus, as I said, is on making sure that all of our members have access to service. So our number one uh, focus is our unserved members and, and along with that, the underserved members. Um, uh, you know, getting to places that already have, uh, you know, fiber service may or may not make sense, uh, probably not, <laughs> certainly not in the beginning. Uh, and we're focused first and foremost on our members 
but there will be non-members who get included. Um, first of all, because of the RDOF process, there are some areas that um, while we were focused on, on member um, electric service areas, you necessarily pick up some areas that are outside our service territory. And then over time, there'll be logical areas that are adjacent to where we serve um, that still they're non-members, but they make sense from a business model standpoint. The other thing that I think is absolutely gonna happen is um, many of the communities we serve, we don't provide electric service in the entire community, but in order to um, work with the community and hopefully access grant funds with them, uh, we would go in and serve the whole community. So that's kind of how we'll, we'll be looking at those, uh, at that decision. Okay. Let's uh, pick up a comment that came in earlier. Uh, Kathleen said, when planning our project, if we have public access data that dates from 2014 of all the residences, and we know where the towers are, and we know where there is dark fiber, and we map this on Google Earth, would this be good enough? And I guess good enough for a, for a plan. Since we have to wait and fight for the provider information, it will take us two years before we have perfect data. So any, any comments on that in terms of mapping? I think Eric, you had mentioned the difficulty of mapping. Actually, Steve, did you run into that when you had to, or did to show uh, uh, that you were going into uh, census blocks without competition or did you just, it was just whatever the FCC said? It's, so it's whatever the FCC said and that has been, <laughs> that has been a challenge. Um, uh, so yeah, we just use their data for that purpose. Yeah, and I think for Kathleen, you know, if you are, you know, thinking of, uh, uh, you know, some sort of grant money that's behind uh, not having service, uh, you can bring that information to the FCC. There is a process for, because you'd basically be challenging if someone said there is service. Uh, if it's more, and, and uh, also in uh, the Q&A, someone was saying, hey, I can, I can literally see the Verizon Tower. Uh, you know, why don't I have uh, service? Uh, and, you know, the, the, the wire guys are offering, you know, to, to install for, you know, more than my house is worth. Um, that is the role of the Public Utility Commission. Uh, I mean, yes, because you can see the tower, uh, you may not be in a sector that gets irritated. And, you know, can you convince them? And you heard Steve talk about all of the financial issues of, of providing service. Now, one would think if there's a tower up there with radios on it already, it's an incremental cost. Uh, but, you know, you, you need to ask the PUC to find out. Uh, and likewise, you know, what sounds like a lot for fiber uh, might actually not be a lot. Or it's their way of saying, yeah, no, we think you're going to be getting 100 megabit service. It's not worth your time. And that's where, uh, you know, hopefully you can get some government intervention to, to kind of mediate that. Uh, Gary, if I could add. Um... Sure. I'm not sure this gets directly to Kathleen's question, but I, I think people, one of the things, if you haven't worked in this area, you should know is, so that FCC just, you know, uses this 25.3 as the definition of being served. And there are lots of areas that nominally have 25.3 service because they have DSL. But um, when you go and you actually do, you know, somebody's, you know, far from the node or, you know, you do an actual speed test, you find out they're way, way less than that. And so they're shown as served, they're not eligible um, for a lot of these subsidies and yet people don't really have good access. Yeah, that does, uh, yeah, I saw that comment too. And, uh, uh, and there's another comment in there as well uh, that uh, the FCC has tried to uh, work with and it's called Measuring Broadband America. Uh, and, and what that program does is uh, we put uh, what we call a white box. It, it basically does not look at all at your traffic, whatever, but it, it becomes a node in your, your network connected directly to your uh, router. Uh, and it measures your ISP's performance. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it's a voluntary system, uh, but it basically uses, uh, uh, what is it called? Embarrassment <laughs> as the enforcement mechanism. Uh, because unlike, say, UCLA speed test, uh, so like speedtest.net or DSL reports, 
uh, the program knows the service tier you've signed up for. So if you do a speed test and it comes and says you got 25.3 service, that's great, except you're paying for 100 megabit service. That's really bad. Uh, or in other areas, you're getting 150 megabit service. That's super great because you're actually paying for 100 megabit service. So, you know, the program knows uh, what your speed tier you're in. And then what the, the FCC does is it publishes uh, basically how close the providers get to what they advertise. Uh, and you would probably not be shocked to hear uh, DSL is chronically, you know, 70, 80% of advertised on a good day, uh, all the way over to uh, uh, cable, which tends to be about 110, 120% of advertised. And by the way, this has gone through the pandemic as well. An interesting thing we have learned from this program, though, is like when you do speedtest.net from your Wi-Fi laptop while the microwave is on, uh, we've learned that people have really bad Wi-Fi networks. And that's one of the reasons we connect direct to the modem, because it ends the argument over, you know, my, my connection is bad versus my Wi-Fi is bad. Clearly, with some providers, the connection is bad. All right. I'd like to, um, you alluded to this, uh, Eric, I want to read this um, gentleman's comment. He said, our house is in a desert island one mile away from existing Comcast service with only a few homes nearby, and most of those are vacation homes. We got an $80,000 quote to install fiber, along with exorbitant monthly rates. Is Starlink our only realistic option? We also have a line of sight to a Verizon tower. I trust others are in a similar situation. Ideas? So I guess two things. Larry, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the, the uh, line of sight issues with Starlink? And then uh, to Steve asking you, uh, you talked about symmetrical uh, service, uh, ideally fiber to the home. But are there some locations where at least near term you would do maybe a fixed wireless link to, to get above DSL speeds for somebody? So Larry, you first. And you'll have to unmute. Or maybe God, there you can go. you hear me now? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah, the, the, I think it was uh, Eric talked about uh, things like foliage getting in the way. And surely the same thing goes with the, uh, with SpaceX or any of these satellites. You do need, um, you know, a clear view of the of the sky. Um, and so, like I have a, a little a mountain home, um, and it's surrounded by pine trees. So I would have a really hard time getting uh, SpaceX connectivity. If you, it's kind of funny, uh, Elon Musk this kind of quip. He said, "Oh." It, it's easy to install. All you have to do is plug it in and point it at the sky. But if you go to this, uh, the Reddit uh, Starlink uh, discussion, you see pictures of all these uh, guys that have, you know, have towers on the top of their houses and giant towers with with uh, dishes on top. So no, it's, it's uh, the same problems. So I would encourage uh, Ken you to look at the Reddit uh, columns because you'll, you'll get a lot of uh, practical information from people who are playing with the, uh, the beta. So then to Steve, are you, are you considering other technologies other than fiber, maybe as a near-term solution for some people? So um, at the risk of going beyond my nine months of experience in the industry, what I, what I would tell you is this, our plan is to essentially build fiber everywhere um, there are some places where I think fixed wireless is a possibility, especially in the near term, and that is our service territory includes most of the islands in Lake Winnipesaukee. Mm -hmm. And so getting to some of those, it may make more sense to use a fixed wireless solution. So you, might, you might have to get a submarine to lay cable or something. <laughs> Fiber. Uh, another question, are the providers who receive the RDOF money being audited for performance? Eric, do you know what the FCC's plans are for follow-up as this gets deployed? No, I should know. I don't remember, so I won't say something wrong, but that is all uh, on the 
uh, the FCC website, you, you can find stuff about uh, 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 how it's being audited. Because they do have, uh, and I'm sure actually, Steve, you, you should be in a position to do that because I think you have like specific, and it's either annual or, or, or you know, over a number of years uh, hitting, hitting targets. Yeah, so there's, there's filing requirements. So in that sense, they, you know, there's a natural audit built in. I do know that our National Association of Co-ops has submitted comments to try to ensure that the FCC follows up uh, on, on this issue of whether people really intend to build, but uh, I don't know what the process for that is. Steve, could I, could I ask, do you consider satellite for any of those uh, islands in remote places? Uh, I don't believe that's been under consideration. I, you know, I guess I, I'm not in a position to rule it out, but I know that we've talked about fixed wireless and, and we're used to, I mean, we have submarine cables for the electric service, so that's not something new, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the cost is that's associated with that, you know, depending on the number that are, that are on a given island. And some of those islands are relatively small. Uh Question from someone, what happens in a town like ours where 75% of the people have cable with 25.3 and the other have DSL with seven megabit per second or nothing? You're not gonna get subsidies. Uh, and, and that's a problem because clearly you're not getting what you know, today considered adequate service. So from the New Hampshire co-op standpoint, Steve, what, uh, what is pacing your ability to, um, to deploy service? I mean, obviously if money is one aspect of it, but if you had all the money you needed, um, seems like resources, people uh, would, be a, would be a challenge as well. And equipment. Yeah. Well, there's a few, challenges. So I've heard people refer to the current situation as a, a you know, land rush. And, you know, the industry, um, I'm told, has never seen anything like this. I think we can all understand that that's obviously the case in terms of funds that are available. And so materials and equipment are an extremely short supply personnel. Uh, and for us, you know, it involves building an organization or partnering with one. And so those are, um, those are all challenges. I think we've proven, you know, we, if we need to make it happen, we can make it happen. Um, but when you're doing a larger enterprise like this, I think there's, there's more planning that goes into it. Uh, it's, it's different from just standing up one, you know, kind of um, isolated system. But there will, you know, definitely timing concerns from a materials and equipment uh, standpoint, I know that everybody's facing. So Ken asks if there are technology improvements likely for DSL in the future, or are we at the technology limits? And my understanding is uh, DSL quality is driven by length of uh, your distance from the central office, but given the cabling, there are limits to copper. Yeah, those are the two drivers there. And there's a third driver, remember Shockey's law, you know, money's the answer, what's the question? You've got billions being poured into low earth orbit satellite. You've got, uh, well, actually billions, it was just announced two and a half billion dollars for 5G research uh, by the Biden administration. Uh, so billions being put into 5G. I haven't heard of any initiatives for the next generation of DSL. Yeah. And, and the copper wires are, de are deteriorating as we speak. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I think what AT&T is sad, maybe Verizon too, that they're no longer supporting their copper network in some locations. That's worthy of another webinar. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, are there, and Eric, you may have touched on this, but are there legislative moves to correct the FCC's inadequate uh, census block data model? Yes, so uh, 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 President Trump signed the Broadband Data Act uh, and one of its, uh, it, it was a bipartisan bill. You know, this was, you know, there are some things that get overwhelming support, not 
you know, 51, 49 votes. This was a, a big positive vote. Uh, the current acting chair of the FCC, uh, 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 acting chair uh, Rosenworcel, was very, very much behind getting these new, uh, uh, you know, this new model of, of like, where do we really have service as opposed to, oh, you touched a census block, therefore it's served. Uh, and in fact, that might even help address that uh, the person who mentioned their municipality where, you know, 75% meet the broadband definition. So, hey, that's way more than one. Uh, you know, this will be able to tease th those kinds of situations out. So I actually think that will, uh, uh, you know, see some fruition in the next, uh, you know, few years. So Steve, a question, uh, a number of the folks that have been commenting or asking questions have kind of been stating their dilemmas with poor broadband service and, you know, being a certain distance away from a tower or whatever. For someone in, in New Hampshire, what would be your recommendation? How does a homeowner tap into what options are available to them? Is there something at the state level that they could talk to? Do they go to their local town or community? Is there sort of a central resource within the state that is compiling information or, or what? Um, in terms of the, the need to just make themselves known, is that, is that what the question relates to? Yeah, make themselves known and, and maybe find out what, what options. I mean, as everyone has pointed, given all the programs and all the activities taking place, someone may not realize that um, something is already taking place in their town and, or, or that they could be part of a ground level movement to try to make something happen. Well, um, two counties uh, that I know are working on it. Carroll County has a broadband group and Grafton County does. And I, I think Grafton County has done some work with Coas County. Um, so I'm aware of those. And then, as I said, almost every town has a broadband committee at this point. And so you can just go to your um, town hall and ask about that. And I, the odds are very good that um, you would make a connection there. The, the state does have a, I'll call it a broadband czar. Um, the person who I knew uh, in that office um, has retired and I, I don't know who the current person is who's uh, who's running that, uh, so I, I can't provide a name there. All right, so a number of counties have broadband uh, committees or people that are active in this area. And Gary, if I may, uh, you know, your mileage may vary, but 15 years ago when I was living in Southern New Hampshire, uh, the broadband committee's threat of building a municipal network was enough to get the cable provider to roll out uh, pretty decent broadband. Uh, so, you know, money's the answer. And if you're saying we're gonna take away your money, uh, sometimes they respond. So I've heard in some, uh, certainly some locations are around the country, and I've heard this is the case in uh, New Hampshire, that uh, there are laws that preclude a municipal or a municipality from building a local network uh, that in effect protects a commercial endeavor. And I've been told, um, for example, that Bedford, New Hampshire has, has that kind of Im imposition. Steve, can you comment more broadly on uh, what, the, what the law is at the state level? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not familiar with the details, but I think there is a law like that because we get inquiries periodically from communities that um, essentially ask for information about um, the extent to which we're providing broadband service in a community, um, even communities where we're not providing anything. And I believe that that is a step in a process they have to follow before they get into the business themselves uh, is to identify who the current providers are. And uh, there's, there's like an information gathering process. So I, I think what you described is, is accurate. I don't know the details. So that would certainly be something that uh, you could go to your your uh, legislator, state legislator, to, to discuss if that's an, an imposition that needs to be changed. It is one of those uh, neither right, neither wrong scenarios because, you know, as Steve 
pointed out, one of his greatest concerns is, is he ever going to get paid back? Right. And now imagine he's uh, gotten some art off funding or even better yet, he found a place that looked profitable. And then the municipality says, you know what, we're going to compete with you. Uh, and so what would Steve do? He would be rational. He would have never built in the first place. So that's where, uh, and the other reason why states ban municipal networks in some states is because, you know, when I talked about the doom and gloom and the city goes bankrupt, actually it's the state that stuck with the bill, not the city. Mm. Uh, that said, a blanket ban is just not right either. You know, I gave you the example where the threat of a municipal network, we ended up with a commercial solution. Or there are just some places, as you know, Steve has found, where you know, just no for-profit entity could ever build there. And you, know, you would need to build it yourself. So why not, why deny uh, you know, a, a municipality broadband if that's their only option? So I know there are a couple of examples, I think, um... Back in the day when uh, Google Fiber was all the talk, where some communities have installed fiber networks and then basically make it available to any internet service provider. And I believe Huntsville, Alabama is one example of that, where um, Google is providing service, but they don't uh, really own the fiber infrastructure. Uh, any, any comments on that, Eric? Or <laughs> Well, so, so, you know, uh, in Southern New Hampshire, you had all those people who were veterans of the network equipment, Route 128. And so we kind of thought we knew what we were doing. Uh, Arlington, Virginia, the home of the Pentagon, uh, one of the original homes of MCI, a lot of people who worked at AOL. Uh, and that's exactly what they said. We're going to go out, we're, even though we already are covered by... Uh, Comcast and RCN, we're going to build our dark fiber network because we want to make sure to connect everyone uh, bankrupt. Uh, does that mean nobody should do that? No, it means you need to look really carefully. Uh, and yes, you know, people who really should have known better got it wrong. All right, we have a question for you, Steve. Uh what will be the priority process for NHEC for picking areas in the service territory? And will you make that priority list available to your uh, members? So, as I said, our, our order of priority is serving unserved and I'd say highly underserved areas within the context of obviously if there are good opportunities for high take rates, um, you know, with more dense areas, we we would pursue those as well. Um, we we that's really the first priority is the areas that are less served. Um, that has to be done in the context of a build out that makes sense in terms of a system design, uh, obviously as well. We, you know, and and we will make that known. Uh, we don't have that right now, so I don't have you know names of towns to announce. But that's something they could follow up with you. And as it once it's available, it would be communicated. Yes. And I, I guess the other thing I have to stress, um, and this goes to the issue again, which has come up uh, several times in terms of working hand in hand with communities. If uh, a relationship with a community is, is, enables us to access significant grant funds or, or group of communities, that's got to drive the decision making because that's a huge risk mitigator for us. And so um, that, that will absolutely uh, weigh in as well. So a comment, um, sounds like we're being taken to task a little bit here. I know that it's easy to believe that it's an implementation issue in quotes, but how can we get you all to think about latency under load? That is keeping latency low even when the link is fully loaded avoiding buffer bloat. So any comments about, uh, about how the network really performs under load? I mean, fiber, I don't think that would be a problem, but maybe oh, it is. cable? It is, in fact, uh, what the, uh, the buffer bloat is a technique used to make your service look really fast, but it's not. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> 
And, you know, in a sense, money's the answer. What's the question? Well, if the FCC is measuring speed, you might optimize your network to deliver what looks like big speed, except uh, basically your packets hang out at the ISP for a while. Uh, and so, you know, part of, you know, one of the attacks on that is, well, measure what people care about, speed and latency. So latency is uh, measured. Uh, that has, uh, actually, if I said it fixed the ISP problem, I'm sure people will come up with places where it's not. But what we also found is modem manufacturers, we got the fastest modem. And so they have big buffers in there. And that's like now the current, uh, buffer bloat uh, pain point. Uh, the Measuring Broadband America does its best to measure actual network conditions. Uh, I say does its best because since uh, it's a volunteer panel, if you have one of these in your home, uh, you don't want it to fire off when you're in the middle of a uh, New Hampshire town council meeting uh, and you really want the, the network to work. Right. Uh, so it, it only does its tests when you're not busy. Uh, the idea is that statistically you hope to capture the network under load as well. All right, so one of our viewers uh, is turning uh, his statement into a question. When might it make sense for a municipality to look to bonding for internet service? Uh, that's, I mean, I mean, it really is, is uh, you know, I would say it's, it's the last resort thing, because that means even Steve can't do it. Yeah, and I was going to say, one of the things we really feel we have to offer and hope communities will work with us on is we're, ultimately, we're going to pay for this system, whether it's through uh, our own funds or grant funds we're able to access or a partner we're working with. But we don't believe that the community should have to bond for this. We don't think that model uh, is necessary or makes sense. And it's just imposing additional costs on the subscribers in the end. So that's something that some competitive providers have used. Uh, they've gotten into a few communities that way. But we, we think that's just passing you know, the bill from the investors to the subscribers. Right. And. Uh... An add-on comment from Rich, no town, especially a small town or city, wants to build a network. As you point out, it's a lot of work. They only look into this when commercial entities fail to provide service to their citizens. And then another comment, um, apparently, I guess it's Senate Bill 170, passed in, uh, looks like 2018, uh, says, does allow municipal networks. So you can find that at uh, gencourt.state.nh.us. You can read that. So according to uh, Michael, um, that in, 19, in 20, 2018 apparently was addressed. A couple other comments, great presentation, thanks. Thank you all, I learned a lot tonight. Um, we have a little bit of a, a negative comment about Charter and Spectrum, one of the winners in the ARDOF competition. Um, as we all know, everybody has their favorite cable company that they like to uh, beat up on. So I want to uh, thank you all. Let's see if we have any more last minute questions coming in before we wrap up. This has been, uh, this has been very um, educational. I've learned a lot and I appreciate, I think, a good mix with your various backgrounds and interests and work and uh, expertise, it's been, um, it's been great. So before we end, let's see if I can do one last screen share. I've got so many windows open right now. Here we go. And we'll flip. All right. Do you see the agenda? Hopefully that shows up. So I want to uh, thank officially our presenters tonight for your expertise. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this was a volunteer effort. None of you are getting rich and famous, well, maybe famous, but not rich out of this presentation. Um, I also want to acknowledge Wei Lu, a professor at Keene State College, 
who's been uh, invaluable in assistance in setting this up. Also, Keene State College for the Zoom webinar platform that uh, allowed us to uh, have as many people as wanted to join tonight. And unfortunately, Jim Isaac, the chair of the IEEE New Hampshire section, was not able to attend tonight, or at least at the beginning, because he had another commitment. But um, he is the, uh, I think, inspiring vision for this session tonight and has felt like the uh, New Hampshire section could do work in this area and try to be an information resource for the, for the people of New Hampshire. So um, I think based on my experience tonight, uh, it's been a good successful effort and we'll, we'll look to do this again. So thank you, Eric. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Larry. And I hope we'll uh, meet again on a Zoom stage. Thank you, Gary. It was thank great. Thank you. Good night. Take care, everybody. Good night. Bye, guys. Bye.